stupid childproof caps. Like all other kinds of medicine, the medical therapies for mental illnesses have come a long way over the years. Uh, when you look at the ancient treatments of these mental disorders, what you see is a fear of and belief in evil forces. It's like these mental disorders, you know, things that we would nowadays recognize as schizophrenia or bipolar or dissociative identity. These things were thought to have been caused by, like, demons or witches or devils or something like this. So as you can imagine, the treatments that were performed, the medical treatments that were performed to try to help these individuals were n not usually very successful. Uh, one example of these was trepanation or trepanning. This is the process of using like a drill or a chisel or something like that to m create a hole in the uh, patient's head. So usually it's in the temple. So you bore or you chip or you bash a hole in the patient's head to try to release those evil spirits. Like I said, as you can imagine, these treatments were not very effective. In fact, mo they were most often quite deadly. And as time went on, as we got into like the 1500s, the 1600s, uh, around the time of the European Renaissance, we saw a lot of intellectual growth and people, they moved away from these kind of spiritualist beliefs. But they still didn't know, we still didn't have modern medicine, so they still didn't know how to help these people. So what they did instead is they basically just put them into a mental institution and left them there. And these mental institutions, these asylums, they were pretty terrible places. In many, in many instances, these places were so much worse than the prisons of the time. Like the conditions were just deplorable, you know, their people would people with serious mental problems would be let loose inside this institution and there'd be physical violence, sexual abuse, uh, defecation, it's just, it's horrible, it's, it's hellish. But the point is we just, we didn't know what to do with these people. We had no treatments for these people. And it wasn't until much later, and until 1793, that we see a French physician named Philip Pinel who, you know, went to these institutions, recognized how horrible they were, and then initiated the more humane treatment of mental patients. So that was this great, you know, like kind of revolution in Europe. And that idea, that, you know, revolutionary idea was brought to the U.S. by Clifford Beers, who founded the mental hygiene movement in an effort to improve the quality of our mental institutions because he had personally experienced many of them and he, as you can imagine, found these conditions to be unsatisfactory, to put it simply. Modern medical therapies that were developed using the scientific method have shown a lot of effectiveness. Uh, so while many disorders that can and often are treated using psychotherapy, usually medical therapy is also an important component of their you know, treatment. And medical therapies, those are typically administered by medical doctors or psychiatrists. Remember, a psychiatrist, that's just a medical doctor who's gotten extra training on the treatment of psychological disorder. Now, one of the most common and one of the most popular and effective kinds of medical therapies are the drug therapies. Uh, you could also call it psychopharmacology or pharmacotherapy. And there's many different kinds of drugs that have been developed to help people with different kinds of problems. Like you have a class of drugs called anxiolytics, which help to produce relaxation and reduce anxiety. Example would be like Valium. Then you have the antidepressants, which elevate mood and combat depression. Things like Prozac, Paxil, and Zoloft. Then you have mood stabilizers, which help to even out mood, especially when it comes to like mania. These would be things like lithium. Then you have the antipsychotics, which help to tranquilize and reduce hallucinations and delusions, like Haldol or Thorazine. 
And then you have the stimulants, which are mostly used to treat intention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Like uh, examples would be like Ritalin, Adderall, or Dexedrine. So all of these different drugs, they have been scientifically demonstrated to be very effective. And with, you know, an expert psych psycho or psychiatrist or medical doctor, if they know how to diagnose the client, if they diagnose the client properly, these drugs can be extremely effective. There's other medical techniques, though, that I also wanted to mention. Uh, some of these are still being done, and some of them are still very, very effective, like electroconvulsive therapy, you know, ECT. You may have heard of this or seen this in a movie. What happens is they, like, they strap the person down to a table, put, like, a mouth guard in their mouth, and then shock them. You know, an electrical shock is passed through the brain, and that induces a convulsion. So the person's entire body starts, like, convulsing because of this electrical shock. Now, if you didn't know why you would want to do this, it's, it's not like they're punishing the person. The reason why you do this is because it actually has been shown, uh, scientifically demonstrated, to be very effective at treating people with severe depression. But exactly why it's effective is not entirely clear. Um, people who support this treatment, people who think this treatment is very, very important, uh, they claim that passing that electrical shock through the brain kind of like resets the brain chemistry and helps the person to overcome like this depress depressive cycle that their brain has gotten stuck in. But critics of ECT would claim that the reason why it shows this effectiveness at treating severe depression is because you're basically like scrambling the person's brain. You're making them basically forget why they were depressed and as a result they will show signs of improvement but whether you support or reject it it definitely is a very effective treatment for severe depression but it's only used in those very severe cases when other treatments have failed now a kind of treatment that isn't really done anymore ever except in the most extreme of circumstances is psychosurgery so that's the surgical alteration of the brain in order to produce behavioral or emotional change. Uh, the reason why we don't do this is because while it used to be a very popular technique, we've since, since then we've gained a much better understanding of the various parts of the brain and what they do. So the thought of removing these extremely important regions of the brain or damaging these parts of the brain is nowadays pretty much unthinkable. Like back then, they really didn't know what most of the brain did. So if you, you know, if you destroy this little bit up here, who cares? You know, it doesn't seem to be that important. But now we understand that all parts of the brain are very important. But when you look at the history of medical therapies, you definitely see that this kind of psychosurgery, what, what the, the most popular procedure was called a prefrontal lobotomy, these things were very, very popular. So I actually have a video down in the links about the popularity of this kind of prefrontal lobotomy and how it was developed, how it came to be popular, and then finally how it died. But thankfully, we don't really perform this procedure at all anymore. Something that we definitely do uh, still perform quite often is various kinds of institutionalization or hospitalization. And that's, while that has like kind of a negative connotation, it's not as bad as you might think. In fact, in most cases, when, uh, when clients are put into these institutions, it's usually voluntary. Like they want to be there. They want to go there because that atmosphere, that institution is very relaxing and it helps them to just, you know, think to themselves and overcome their own issues in an environment that's relatively free from stress. So most of the time it is voluntary, but yes, of course, there are some cases where, you know, because of a, a judge's ruling or something like that, a person is involuntarily placed in a mental institution. But like I said, most of the time, most of the time it's voluntary. And that's because a lot of these institutions, they are pretty nice. They are very, it's just imagine like a really nice hotel 
where the wait staff is always there to help you and give you the things that you want. It can be extremely, you know, pleasant experience. New medical therapies are being developed all the time. So when we look at the future of medical therapy, what we're going to see are more kinds of therapies that can be provided by lower cost practitioners like counselors and social workers and psychiatric nurses. And there's definitely going to be much more of a greater use of short-term solution-focused problem-solving approaches. So much more precisely targeted medical therapies with fewer side effects. And one good example of this that's currently being developed would be transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. So this, this uses magnetic pulses to temporarily block activity in specific parts of the brain. So they, they take this electromagnet and they stick it up to the side of your head, flip a switch and then flip it back off again, and that will you know, make a disruption in that little area inside your skull. So it's definitely non-invasive. You don't need to like open up the skull or anything like that, and it's reversible. Because like I said, it's just a magnet. It's not going to do any kind of permanent damage. It's just going to disrupt the activity for a very brief moment. Now using a magnet to do this kind of you know, disruption has been shown to be effective at treating a wide range of things. You know, the, the research is still being done, but it does show a lot of promise at treating things like addiction and depression and even some kinds of anxiety. Another uh, medical therapy that's being developed is transcranial direct current stimulation. So that's TDCS or Sometimes it's called TCDS. But now we are talking about putting electrical current into the brain. So that's, that's exactly what it, you know, it sounds like exactly what it is. You know, you put one electrode on one side of the brain and the other electrode on the other, and you pass a current through the brain. So the pa when you do this, you're, you're passing a constant, weak electrical charge through the brain, which will stimulate the regions that are between those two electrodes. Now, you don't need to worry about the person being electrocuted to death or anything like that. The, the, the amount of electricity that's passing through the brain is roughly equivalent to like a 9-volt battery. So it's not, it's not anything terribly scary. But e even though it's, uh, it's clearly not going to, you know, fry you or anything like that, when I was working on my PhD, we had one of these devices in our laboratory and even though I understand that it's not going to do any permanent damage, I was still too much of a chicken to participate in that study. But the studies that have been done have definitely shown some evidence of TDCS being effective for treating many of the same things that TMS can, like depression, maybe even anxiety. The research is still being done, but it really seems like this is a great alternative to a lot of the other treatments that we currently have for these kinds of disorders.